know, sometimes non-Aboriginal people, they have a hard time, like, understanding how to communicate with Aboriginal people. But what you don't realize is that, like, we're different from nation to nation, too. So I had just been up in Cree territory, and I was doing a little bit of work up there, and I went to a social gathering, otherwise known as a party, and I thought, oh my God, I'm moving. I'm moving here. This is clearly one of these communities that dig big women. <laughs> everybody at this party was putting the make on me. I mean, everybody. Everywhere I turned, people were doing this. <laughs> I'm buying drinks. I'm like, how you doing? <laughs> Finally, somebody said to me, hey, Candy, you better put your ego back in your pants. It's rude for Cree people to point. Everybody's saying, who's that? How'd I know? I thought she was on the team. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> anyway, I, I am actually from northern New Brunswick and a uh, tiny little place up there. Eel River Bar First Nations where my daddy is from and uh, I grew up in a little place called Pointland Inn. But the town of Dalhousie is kind of where we all got into our trouble and it's the tiniest little town. Our town is so small we actually, we, could, we, we have this thing we say, I'll meet you at the lights. <laughs> we only have one intersection. And so we just say, hey, I'll meet you at the lights. Everybody knows what we're talking about. It's like, it's the lights. We have one ambulance driver, Charles Stewart. That's it, that's all, right? So, and my town has a lot of old people. So you always notice like for two weeks every year, everybody in town is really, really careful. Charles is on vacation. I just did the Moncton Comedy Festival. I was so thrilled, all these people from my hometown. I'm like, oh, sweet, look, there was Cindy, and there's John Moore. And then I was like, oh, Charles Stewart. My parents are still in town. <laughs> you might be able to help me out with this. I, I, it took me a while to try to figure it out. I'm going to Newfoundland. Uh, a storm hits, and I, can't, I can get to the island, but they can't guarantee me they're gonna get me off in time. And I had a gig there, but a gig back here a few days later. So I said, okay, I'm gonna cancel my flight. And, and I had paid for that cancellation fee. So I thought that meant like you could get your money back. Oh, contraire, mon cher. No, 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 no. That simply means they can hold on to your money for a little while longer until your next flight. So I knew I had a gig coming up in Sydney and I said, hey, perfect. I'm gonna book my flight to fly to Sydney. She said, okay, I could hear it. She said, okay, the flight to Newfoundland was $700. Okay, your flight to Sydney is $400. You owe us 90 bucks. I'm like, sorry, I owe you $90? I don't understand. I'm like, okay, wait now. I, I, it was a $700 flight. I'm not a math major, but just bear with me. It's a $700 flight. This is a $400 flight. Isn't that like 300 bucks back to me? With a deadpan voice, she said, clearly, you do not understand the credit system. <laughs> clearly, I don't. They must have taught that on the same day as colonialism and I missed it. Anyway, I am now uh, going to switch gears for a moment and, um, and I just want to tell you first how much it means to me that um, so many of these musicians come on the show. Garrett Mason is Dutchie Mason's son, who many of you may know as uh, the Prime Minister of the Blues. I saw him on his own and I realized, no, that's not Dutchie Mason's son. That's a man and a musician in his own right. And here he is now, Mr. Garrett Mason. Garrett Mason, my love affair started with his dad, and it was through following Dutchie that I saw Garrett play the first time. He's just kind of like this, got this old soul uh, presence on the stage, and uh, just a real beautiful groove to him. I don't wanna hold your hand, baby. I just wanna 
Now listen, everybody rebels against their parents at some point, sometime, some way. So I'm thinking when you grow up as the son of the Prime Minister of the Blues, um, is there a time when you rebelled against the blues? Like, and if so, what was the music that you wanted to rebel with? Yeah, I was totally against it at first because he'd be pl blaring it all the time, you know. So I'd be in my room playing like Pantera and, and uh, Black Sabbath. <laughs> Yeah. Stuff like that. And then earlier before that, I was into like crisscross. <laughs> the reason why I say that, because there was a magazine upstairs that had crisscross and it kind of brought me back. Okay, so um, when you are fine looking young gentlemen like yourselves on the road touring, because let's face it, you could be ugly as sin as soon as you strap a guitar on, the ladies are in. <laughs> so, That's a good uh, one. I'll have to keep that one. But y'all aren't ugly as sin. So tell me what your most bizarro backstage groupie experience or offer has been thus far in the career? I don't know. I can't really think of any. We go out and play, and it's like the guys, the people that like us are like old dudes with ponytails and dad leather jackets. <laughs> you know? Listen, I'm so thrilled that you guys came and did the candy show. It's like just making my night. Thanks for having us, Candy. Appreciate it. Oh, it was our pleasure. Garrett Mason. Ladies and gentlemen, Garrett Mason. 
Thank you.